Okay, in 2009, I was in South Africa in a small village called Uta and with other Stanford GSP students, including this lady over there. We wanted to understand the education system in South Africa. And these children here, they don't speak English. So we envisioned a world where we provide English education to these children to make them a member of the global community. There are 1.5 billion English learners in the world. And our company, Robojon, provides English education with humanoids to 1.5 billion English learners in the world. So in my presentation to you today, I'd like to first talk about the problem we are addressing and the solution we are offering. And then I'd like you to join the discussion in terms of where in the world we should execute this business, whether it is in Asia, US, or somewhere else in the world. So uh, let me talk about the problem first. Uh, when I was uh, between two and six years old, I was in Chicago. Uh, this was my house, the white house, and my English was perfect, native English speaker pronunciation. But then at the age of six, I went back to Japan my parents wanted me to maintain my English capability. So I had two teachers. And I went to English classes three times a week. And uh, one of these two teachers was a native English speaker. She had excellent pronunciation, obviously. And the other teacher was a Japanese teacher. And every time I met with the English native speaker, I thought the class was extremely boring because the class material was simply uninteresting to me. Every time I met with the Japanese speaker, uh, the class material was, was very engaging. But she begged me, uh, please don't pick up my Japanese accent for your English. But a few years later, when I woke up in the morning, I realized that I had too much Japanese accent for my English. So. Uh, so I knew from my experience that human-based English education is not perfect. Uh, one teacher had the problem to engage student. The material was unengaging. The other teacher was very engaging, but her pronunciation was poor, and she had the quality problem as a teacher. I took many entrepreneurship classes at Stanford. And I learned that when I start up a company, I need to speak with hundreds of potential users. So that's what I did. I uh, start incorporated and spoke with about three people on average for six months. So 180 people as a sample. And, and, and then really try to nail down the problem and define it. And so uh, during this process, I realized that many Asian kids actually have English input, but they didn't have opportunity to speak the language. I also realized that these parents are really rich, so they are willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars to give them opportunity to use the language. So I thought, what if, if I spend all of our company resource to this problem? No English input, but to encourage children to speak the language. So that's the problem. And here is the solution uh, we thought of. Um, a few weeks ago, you met with a Japanese company called Cougar, who provides virtual assistant. So what if virtual assistant teach English for you? It's a perfect pronunciation. It can, it can be uh, interactive. You can speak with virtual assistant by a voice recognition technology. Uh, but I spoke with many, many, many users again. And many of these wealthy families, they didn't want their kids to use tablet, addiction concern, and eyesight concern. So I thought this is, this is not going to work. It's also a little bit passive. Tablet can be interactive, but it is not real. We are trying to encourage users to speak the language. So I thought something real is going to encourage users to speak English more. So 
what about cheap robot? Uh, I went on to Alibaba and checked all of the robots on Alibaba website. And this one was the one uh, that voted by many kids as the cutest robot. And it's only $30. And uh, it has all of the capabilities that we, we need for artificial intelligence execution. That's microphone, speakerphone, and camera. So you can do voice recognition, natural language processing, and visual recognition. So I tried this solution with many kids, and it didn't work. Kids were simply uninterested and not engaged with this robot. So we tried many different robots. And as we tried different robots, we realized that when the robots are lifelike, kids were very interested. So this is the solution we came up with. The robot with up to 20 degrees of freedom with lifelike movement, strong CPU to realize local artificial intelligence processing. And so I'd be happy to show you how the kids are engaged with this robot. So how do I move this, I guess? Um, Oh, it's here, I guess. Sorry. I don't see this type of reaction for many kids. They're really excited. This kid looks like American, but he is in Japan. And this is English class in Japan. So in the video, there was uh, a scene where uh, we showed the social connection between the robot and the children. This is a very important issue for education. There is an MIT professor called Sherry Turkle who studied the human-robot social connection, I think, for 15 years. And she concluded that human can develop social connection to robot. And uh, you know, the social connection is really good for English education. We believe that as there is a social connection established, it is easier for kids to be engaged in English conversation with the robot. And we believe there are some studies supporting that.
uh, that we are seeing. So we talked about the solution. Now I'd like to invite you to a discussion uh, in which place in the world we should execute this business. So uh, if we can, I'd like to see gets, to get some comments. I think the floor is open. Yeah. So yeah, and b before uh, getting comments, I'd like to explain some background information. Uh, so 10%, th this is the US market, 10% of all public school students in the United States are English language learners. This means English is not their primary language and they are learning English in the United States. And 1% of all public school teachers are English language learner teachers. That means there is a huge discrepancy between supply and demand, 10x discrepancy. And there is a new regulation that just implemented called Every Student Succeeds Act. So the regulation is changing, new government grant is coming. Uh, it's a great opportunity in the United States. If you look at the world, uh, the yellow country are the countries with low English uh, proficiency. You know, here is the metrics here. If you look at China, 400 million Chinese are learning English. Uh, Japanese are spending, as discussed often, $10,000 a year budget for their kids' English education. So was Korean. So again, it's a great market. Just to summarize, uh, US market, 5 million users need to have English education. And a huge discrepancy between demand and supply. And Japan and Korea, families are spending big amount of budget for English education. Uh, and then there is regulation change in Japan. From 2020, virtually every college applicant needs to take English speaking exam. China, 400 million English learners. There is a, a Chinese company, I think, called VIP Kids, who just raised $500 million. What they are doing is to connect American English speakers with Chinese English learners by a remote uh, tool, uh, like a virtual communication. It's my understanding. So it's a great market. So can um, I get any? Before, before we get into this, Yohei, you presented kids who are really little, right? Like age two, three, and four. Right. Uh, are you looking at a particular target age group too, or what? 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 How do you want to do this? Yeah. So let me let me explain this. So oh, our for, first target age group is the age between two and five years old. There is a reason for that. Uh, we believe that the children at the age between two and five years old can absorb the language like sponge. And startup is about payback period. If it takes long to prove the English uh, education efficacy for our technology, then you know, we are going to have a problem. I used to run the agriculture startup. So I, I learned from my heart that tomato takes time to grow. So we don't want to have tomato-like uh, users. <laughs> we want to have fast learning uh, learners, which is, which is that age group in, in our belief. So, and can I ask one other question? What, can you tell us anything about the price points? So yeah. for instance, are you going to do this as a service, or yes. are you just selling the robots with software installed? How does that work? We want to start this as a service, and this because the first stage of the company is to get learning going. So if you sell the robot at a very high price, and people, if the people are not happy, then we got bad review on the website. Rather, if we provide this as a service, if people are not happy, then we can simply stop the service and then say thank you and uh, can you tell us any feedback? And that's a great learning. So we want to start as a service, and we are when we are super confident, we want to start selling the product. Okay. So now the floor now the floor is open. Uh, so, yes. I think I would start with China, um, and that's because I taught English at 780U, like in Kukubishino, 
and and most of my students are from China, and I just did did it through Zoom. Um, so I think that's a huge market there. Yes. And it's kind of weird now that you can see the homes of your students. Right. Um, but um, I think people, the parents, are willing to pay, and I think their English level needs. Um, you know, like a little bit more work. Right, right, right. So the demand is high, and it's a huge number of people. And yeah, and obviously, $500 million, uh, you know, raised by VIP kids is uh, you know, validation. So thank you. Um, I have done a few education startups and run them. So I'm telling you from my experience, in USA, especially because you're talking the age group, two to five, and they're not necessarily going to school full time. They're, they are great, what is it called? Uh, not kindergarten, even before kindergarten. Yeah, right? yes. yeah. Like Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, <coughs> as soon as they start doing that, and when they go to school, they may not have picked up completely. They have picked up half from a robot, and if they don't play with other kids, that could affect. You probably want to experiment on robot, human, other similar age group competition. Mm -hmm. So your concern is that if they're interacting with the robot instead of going to daycare, yeah. right? Yeah. Suppose they're interacting with the robot in daycare. Yeah, but what is the advantage of doing that? Because the daycare does that job. That's the that the purpose of the kid at that age being able to absorb the language and be quote unquote natural, not a robot child. Mm -hmm. So that is you have to think about very carefully. And then you have to be looking at only routinely choose those families where English is not spoken by their parents, even in USA. Could be Hispanic, could be Latino, uh, could be foreigners who come here from countries where it, it's not spoken. But I have not seen kids going through trouble just speaking English. I'm still not convinced that what other kids or the environments will provide will not be substituted by a robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank so you for the great comments. So if we go to the US market, I think it is going to be the teacher aid uh, for English language learner in public schools. The, the problem there is that yeah. the schools have their regulation of mm -hmm. what they want to do. Because when we were trying to sell, we, I had a high, ask a high other video game based education company and so on in USA. I looked at different markets. Yeah. All school districts are not identical. They're all different with their own curriculum. Mm -hmm. and, and so each of those schools will tell you what is best for them, and you're taking the job of the teacher aid or whichever it is. You're teaching math, you're teaching English, you are, you are replacing so those. Can I follow up and, and ask a question? Yeah. Uh, the person at MIT or somebody else who studied sort of child-robot interaction or human-robot interaction, do they find that that does make interaction with other humans, is that a negative factor for how people socialize with other real people, or does it have an impact? I didn't read that in the book I read, uh, okay. but, but the author was negative in terms of human uh, robot social connection because robot doesn't have any heart. So why do you want the human to be connected to the robot? Was the author's point. Yeah. Um, so I understand that point, mm -hmm. and I still believe that for the education purpose, uh, this can be leveraged. But certainly, kids have had robotic toys forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is this is old. That's even before we've had robots with AI. So I think that you know, every, ever, since, ever since people have been putting things together for kids to play with, they've put together mechanical devices that 
arguably would be kind of the same sort of function that the, the robot would have. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So what do I have for other markets? We've got one for China. We've got one person that says kind of U.S. is going to be t difficult to work with. Do I hear <laughs> Japan and Korea? Do I hear uh, anybody from Southeast Asia? Thank you for a very timely talk on robots and language. I'm curious uh, to what degree your uh, AI path with, say, English to um, robot, uh, Japanese and Korean to robot language, uh, China to robot teacher um, is developing, and would it not make most sense to go to the market where that AI language um, sort of path is the most robust or most uh, interactive or vibrant? Yeah, so, so I think the question is that uh, uh, in terms of the interpretation and culture-wise, uh, you know, where uh, go to the market where the AI adaptation is is easiest, right? So that's a that's a very interesting point. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Um, what we are doing in terms of uh, uh, a little bit of the artificial intelligence is that we are gathering the user uh, data, uh, user profile data, what kids like, and so on, and incorporate that into the conversation of the robot with the kids. Uh, so thinking about that, each country has a different culture, right? So for instance, uh, J Japanese kids may have different food pre preference from uh, Chinese kids. So we, we, we need to localize the content. So I haven't thought about what makes more sense. So, but what do you think <laughs> makes more sense? My inclination would be go to, to develop the AI most robustly. So if there was a MIT link for English, um, that would, or a Google link for um, many of these languages, that would develop a uh, language most robustly. Um, so uh, you know, I think your robot will be t speaking Chinese, speaking Japanese, speaking Korean, speaking English. And um, your observations about culture make a lot of sense. Right. Actually, we, we, we are having robot only speak in English right now. Uh, and th this is because our first target user has sufficient English input. So we are making the conversation content such that easy enough for our user to understand. And as the user's uh, learning goes up, or as, as we understand the user has more knowledge, we put more difficult uh, English words to the content. Um, but as we roll out, we would need to have like like uh, Japanese, Korean, Chinese content. Uh, so so I understand that is coming. So thank you, thank you for the advice. I do also think that Indian market is pretty good for consideration. Um, there is a very well studied English speaking tradition, and then uh, just in comparison to China, uh, China does emphasize a lot of grammar. Um, the Chinese education itself. It's less into the uh, pronunciation is a bit plus, but it's not a requirement and it cannot be easily quantified in exams. So in terms of that, uh, perhaps like building upon uh, the English speaking tradition in India and also just the huge population and the size of the market there, perhaps also be beneficial. Mm. It's a great point. I haven't thought about that. You know, if you look at this map, uh, India actually it's green, it's, you know, not so high English proficiency. So, thank you for that. We we have a team of Indian writers, English writers in in India. So, we we will consider that. So, uh, well, I'm from India. So I uh, after looking at that uh, moderate level of English, what you uh, uh, showcase there. Um, we have seen the education system, which uh, has, um, uh, as, as you said, kindergarten and preschools. Uh, they're pretty well established uh, with whatever the advanced English what they are. But there are uh, parents who are looking for kids uh, to come back home or to be at home and learn more 
and they want a they want a system which can help them out in that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I take it this in a positive way. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of parents who say, okay, uh, my kid, yeah, they go to kindergarten, they learn English there, fine, but once they're back, they'll not be able uh, to help them out in the same standard as kindergarten uh, uh, teachers would do, mentors yeah. would do. So they want some system at home also which can help them out uh, you know, to keep that flow. That's a great point. Thank you. Parents feel about the robot. I'm sorry. How do your parents feel about the robot? Oh, um, so this uh, depends on the parents for our user base. So one of the uh, parents, uh, I think the mother liked the robot, uh, and then and then the kids were very excited about the robot, uh, and then father came over the weekend. And the father said, ah, this is kind of noisy. Uh, and the kid started losing her interest. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, another user, a uh, mother was interested, and kids got interested. And then the father came, and then kids showed to father how to use the robot. And the kids used English words uh, in that interaction with the far father that she never used. So that amazed the father that, oh, uh, my daughter didn't speak this English word, but she's now guiding me how to use the robot in English. So, so uh, we also observed that. So, so Yohe, besides making the video, can you tell us anything about how many kids you've had try out the robot learning English? And uh, are you charging money for this already, or is it really still at the stage of uh, kind of proof of concept? Oh, it's still proof of concept. Uh, we are very early stage, so uh, in fact, some of the users said that I'd be happy to pay for that. And I learned from business school that you don't discount the price for the evangelist user. Uh, uh, but you know, I, I don't think we are there yet to charge the money to our users, even though they are willing to pay for it. So I'm violating the textbook principle and not charging right now. Um, Is the plan to, uh, say, put in content every month that would be personalized to the user? How much will the robot store and do you update it? I mean, could a kid potentially use this for years or what, what, how do you see this happening? Yeah, so our goal is for, for kids to use it for years uh, and then charge subscription fee. That's the goal. Um, the, so you would download software into the robot every so often? Right, right. Every week is our, our goal. Um, we are doing kind of that right now. Uh, every week is uh, kind of tough because you know, every time we release it, there needs to be stabilization test before release. So stabilization test could take two weeks. So even if you do this in parallel, uh, still every week is a little bit tight, but we are doing that right now. So. And can I ask what you're doing with the data on the children's use? Um, you're collecting that, mm -hmm. right? And analyzing it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. So, so every uh, user uh, we are uh, talking with right now is very supportive. When we roll out, uh, this is something we need to be very sensitive. <laughs> Especially in the United States, there are many regulations that, for example, we need to get explicit consent from the parents, etc. So, um, and before yeah. we before we go on, what's your feeling about advertising? So reducing yeah. the cost of the subscription in exchange for right. either giving data to advertisers or putting ads into the robots. Uh, so I don't think it's a good idea to put the ads to the robot because kids can be very interested, I mean, yeah. influenced by, by the ads. So let's say the robot says, hey, have you watched uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, 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 Disney such and such yeah. movie, and, and, and we could have a big trouble as a result. So. OK. Um, so, yeah.
what is the accent uh, or types of accent being supported in your uh, robo for in which different region people will have a different accent so and the child who is picking it up may have some difficulty and so what kind of accent you are supporting in <laughs> oh, uh, we were we are not at that stage yet we are uh, so so the early stage of the software I mean software company is often to prove the market risk first I, I think so we are using some of the big companies voice recognition system right now and as we become bigger we are going to develop our own uh, voice recognition system. We have excellent software engineers that I'm going to later introduce. Uh, uh, but still, you know, if we develop voice recognition system ourselves, it would take a month, and that could be uh, a risk for the startup. So let me actually move on to explain some additional color of the market. So when we think about humanoid, uh, you know, many of us think that's a future. Maybe the timing is not there yet. But if you look at the market size, it's actually very large. So on the right-hand side of this screen, uh, these are primarily robots for Japanese market. And we are seeing half a billion dollars market only by three companies. And th this is some of the market uh, projection uh, uh, from the data points from these market research reports. It's, it's pretty consistent that it's rising very quickly uh, this is a news from a Japanese newspaper called uh, Yomiuri Shimbun. So Japan has introduced robots to classroom in public schools. And the budget, I would imagine, is going to be increased uh, over years. And if you look at this uh, eyeball, uh, it was introduced in 1999. And uh, it was sold until 2006 uh, for uh, 150,000 units. And each eyeball was about $2,000. So it's $300 million sales for entertainment purpose. Uh, they introduced eyeball 2 recently. And between January and July this year, seven months, they sold 20,000 units. And every time they put here is reservation. They sold out within 30 minutes. So it's very good sales, uh, $40 million at the minimum uh, so far. Um, so these are, I believe, uh, for primary, like Ibo was for like entertainment, I believe. Uh, if you look at Chinese market, uh, here are some of the robot companies that we are following. So we have detailed data for each of these robots. Uh, and most of them are for education purpose. So uh, Chinese have started working on the robot, and they realize that the money is in education. So they, they do STEM education, uh, English education, and others. So it's the Chinese market. So we talked about the market. Uh, I also would like to discuss uh, where in the world that makes sense to execute the product strategy. So here are some options. And again, I'd like to invite you for discussion if you have time. So one option is to fabricate in China. The second option is to do it in Japan. And the third option is licensing. And of course, there are many other options. But for this slide, I picked these three. So if we fabricate in China, obviously it's the center of manufacturing. It's low cost, and the robot market is rising. And so it's easy to find hardware partners. I often went, go to Shenzhen, and every time I go there, I meet with you know, many hardware companies. And most of the time, within one meeting, I, I, have, a, I have a contract with them. So, so very fast execution. On the other hand, there is a trade war going on, obviously, between US and China. Uh, and it's hard to know if the Chinese partners are using authentic parts. If not, then we, we could get trouble. And they could steal, potentially, the intellectual property unless we are careful. So that's Chinese market, I mean, fabrication. Uh, there is an opportunity to fabricate our product in Japan. 
Uh, again, it, 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 it used to be a, a, at least the center of manufacturing. Uh, and as far as the robot, there is a big upside that Fukushima has up to $30 million grant uh, for robot innovation. Um, it's a huge upside. It's $30 million per company. And this a rising robot market and manufacturing and intellectual property is protected. So that's Japanese market. And I forgot to say that we applied for this grant, and I'm very confident that we are going to get the grant. Not $30 million, but much smaller amount. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I worked for Fukushima in my previous life. We delivered a robot to reactor containment vessel inside a Fukushima nuclear power plant. So I know a little bit about Fukushima. So uh, licensing options. So we could license our technologies to other hardware partners with, for example, character rights, Transformers, Star Wars, and everything, and distribution channels and marketing budget. So which options do you think we should take? So you've got the hardware, but you've also got the software. Is the idea that you would have somebody make the hardware and then you would take delivery of the robot and then put the software in somewhere else? Or what would, how would this work? Uh, right now, we only have software. OK. That's and, what your company has. Right. And we could consider purchasing some of the hardware companies or hardware company IP. OK. Can you do it both? Both. Hybrid in China or Japan? Yes, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, the most important IP, so I'm an IP attorney, right? So the most important IP I would not do in China, I would have it done in Japan. And that way, you'll, you'll also get the grants. And then you'll also save costs in China. <coughs> right, so right. So the, the difference is a shipment between the two. Yeah, yeah. So important parts, you do it in Japan, perhaps assembly them in China. Yeah. Ah. In the US. In the US. In the US. Yeah. Do it differently. Yeah, I would do number two and number three. So you need to do number two yeah. to show the licensing partners that it works. Here's how you do it. Here's my proof. Here's a real proof of concept. Here's the best in class. And now you can apply it to your, your model. And the bet is that licensing will be bigger, than the, uh, be bigger and easier. Right. Over time, but yeah. you need to do it yourself because no one's going to believe right. that it's going to work. Yes. There's only two. two, two. Maybe one. Uh, since you've got the brown. I, I haven't got it, but I'm confident. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, thank you for great advice. That's that's a great idea, I think. So, uh, any any other comments? All, all I do just licensing and not. You can't get that grant. Go straight for that. It'd be quicker. Find right. A, find a company that want to do it and persuade mm -hmm. them it will work, be their partner, and you won't, you won't need to raise as much money. And right. You can be like Microsoft. Like, don't make computers. Yeah. Whatever. Right. Originally, mm -hmm. just just get a few dollars every, uh, every robot. Only do licensing. Yeah. What are the three main companies, the Japanese companies, Sony, let me show this to you. For the humanoids, uh, these companies are big, I believe. Uh, Diagostini, I don't think it's Japanese company. They have Japanese subsidiary, I believe. Uh, but these are like a soft bank, or maybe it's hard to see from there. Soft bank, sharp, and Diagostini is what is written there. For the humanoid. For, for Sony, they had uh, a beautiful humanoid called Kuyo, yeah. which is unmatched. Uh, but I think they stopped selling it or abandoned the plan, they I believe. Have and they have a cat, too. Uh, yeah, they have, they have many different initiatives. Because I was wondering, can, can Ivo or Ammo also be educated? Instead of the humanoid. Right. Maybe better in the U.S. to have pet rather than humanoids, right? Because yeah. I think companies like Mattel are like that. Yeah. I have, um, I have a Cosmo. I yeah. It doesn't have the software. <laughs> <laughs> so this does kind of lead to the question, where do you see your value? Okay, is it the whole system or is it 
the content, the mm -hmm. English language mm -hmm. educational content, or is it the system for making the the robot really interact well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Including paralinguistic yeah. and all mm -hmm. of those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I believe it's a con it's primarily content. So so there is a I believe a way to make uh, a toy humanoid very interesting to kids. And I don't think many have found uh, how to do that with the software. And that's, I, I, I view that as content. OK. Yes. I have a yeah. um, thought process here happening. <clears throat> If you could do a, a child care where your human, I mean the, the robot can teach English, and normally in a child care, people of similar ethnic background or need for English to go there, you can make it a uh, child care cafe. Yeah. So that, you know, they go mm -hmm. for so many hours and they are paid. And, it's sort of food and mm -hmm. things like that. So it becomes a social thing. But m multiple kids of similar age <coughs> coming to a given duration of time. That's a very like innovative that. idea. Yeah. Uh, I have to really think you yeah. know, it's a great option. I just have a question about how uh, the, the enthusiasm of kids of being engaged with robots, how long does that last? Yeah. Because I remember when I was a kid, I used to also have a, like a, a robot dog that you just need something. But the, the kind of interest got lost over the time right. as there's new Barbies, new toys. Yes. Um, and also just kids at the team, uh, over the time when they find out that there's a, that this is a learning tool, mm -hmm. um, I think there is a fire in this. Right, right. So it's not as interesting as just pure entertainment. Yeah. Like also for like iPads. Yes. Yeah, so that's a great point. So many robot companies uh, have viewed that as an issue. So even uh, you know, the experts who are very knowledgeable for Pepper, for example, you know, they, they had a similar comment that you know, Pepper could be $10,000. But what if you know, people get lost interest on the robot? So. Um, so in our observation, uh, we have seen kids whose interest level continued for uh, nine months, uh, because we started in February in terms of the development of the robot. And today is November, so it's about nine months. So some of the kids continued to have interest. Uh, some of the kids, um, one of the kids, uh, who was very enthusiastic at the beginning. And then they, she learned a few English words for the first few days. And then she lost interest when the father said, oh, this is noisy. So, so we, we see some variation right now. Um, uh, we believe it, the key uh, is, is uh, a few things. One is that uh, we, we want to update the content <laughs> regularly. Uh, in terms of the new content coming, uh, it's it's like a, a movie, right? You know, uh, if you watch movie, every week there is new content coming, and you want to know the story next week. So your interest level continue. If you look at the same movie again and again and again, then quickly you would, you would lose your interest. The second thing is uh, the social element, social connection. So. For example, I don't know if you know Tamagotchi uh, or some of the social simulation game. Uh, so the MIT professor I referred to earlier in this presentation, uh, Sherry Turkle, she, she studied uh, Tamagotchi and all of these social robots. And there is a social connection with the robots and humans. Uh, it seems to me that the interest level could sustain. Um, so if you think about that, the way we are doing it is that we get user data points. What are the kids' favorite, let's say, toys or food? As, as the child uses the robot, the robot remembers the user profile of the user. And, 
and the, the robot is going to include that in his next conversation. So it almost feels like the character is developing itself. So it, every time uh, he or she uses it, it's different. So it's unpredictable. And there is going to be a social element because the way we develop friends with others is to know others. So uh, we think that's a key point. Uh, any other points? <coughs> to what degree are you comparing this with the toy market? To get back to your first question, is the toy market bigger in US, Japan, and Korea, or, or other educational games markets? And um, what happens if a competitor comes along, uh, Lego Mindstorms EV3 mm -hmm. robot that kids could build and even uh, code for their own language, uh, right. learning in English or other? Uh, yeah. How do you um, sort of navigate mm -hmm. um, other innovative approaches to language learning? Yeah, that's a great point. So firstly, I don't think we want to target position ourselves as a toy company, because toy uh, is, I mean, at least initially, right? I mean, the toy doesn't have a high price, except maybe Mindstorm. Uh, in terms of the uh, intellectual uh, property issue, uh, I was about to show that. So maybe let me show that. And then if you still have question, maybe we can. Uh, address that. So this is some of the factories in China again. Uh, the robot. There are many, many, many robot companies. Uh, so with that, you know, I think somebody commented, you know, what if if you become Microsoft uh, for robot? But there is an important decision to make here to for us to aspire to become Apple for robot industry, or Microsoft or Android for robot industry. As you know, in early 1980s, there are many IBM clones. And Microsoft provided the software platform for all of these IBM clones so that a software can be executed on different <coughs> hardware. If you look at the phone industry, when I was a college student in early 2000s, I had a smartphone by a Japanese company. We had a browser, we had email. Uh, and so when iPhone was introduced, I was thinking that, well, I had that when I was a college student. But all of these phones died. And if you look at the market today, Android is the market leader. So if you look at the robot market today, uh, there are many robot companies. And for all of these hardware companies, uh, they make software as well, at least them. So should we try to become uh, Apple for like competing with all of these hardware companies or aspire to be uh, some, something like Android for robot industry is the question. To become the Android of the robot industry, uh, it requires special intellectual property. Um, because each robot has different degrees of freedom, different weight distribution, different center of gravity. So if you have software to operate one robot that may not work for another robot, it might, let's say, fall down. So uh, I brought the robot to do a little bit of the demonstration here to uh, move to two robots. Uh, to see if it works. Is it starting up? So this is a robot from two different Chinese companies. This is uh, a robot by a Chinese company called City Easy. And this one is from a company called Linkspot. So uh, let's see if we can move them together. So you're trying to put one command that is being localized into each operating system 
So it's yes. a, it has to be translated in almost to different code, right, for the different robots. It's uh, one software. The network is connected successfully. So let's... That's a good sign. Yeah, a good sign. I have many other dance, but uh, for the purpose of this presentation, let me. Uh, so, uh, so we need to do something like this to become Android for the robot industry. Um, so, uh, in terms of the team, uh, whether it makes sense to uh, build the team in Asia, US, or somewhere else. So before you go into yeah. that, uh, what's your decision? Do you want to be like Apple and compete with your own hardware, or do you want to be the operating system that could make work with multiple robots? Well, uh, it's a million dollars question, so maybe yeah. we can have dinner together <laughs> <laughs> and get your advice. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, but I, I think right now we want to, uh, you know, as he said, first do uh, a little bit of um, our thing. And as we prove it, we are going to gradually switch to licensing type model. Because if, uh, if people don't know if it really is going to make money, you know, people are not going to be interested for the license. So. Yeah, I, I will go ahead and say that that fits what we see in kind of industry evolution, that first you have the end-to-end -end solutions. You know, the robot actually does the English teaching and, and does the playing and so forth. And then as that becomes really well established, then you open up the platform to yeah. third-party developers. Yes. So where to build the team? Uh, so I know Bay Area and Silicon Valley is a very special place. It's a special place because you, know, you want to work with best people, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you want to have best investor. If you're an investor, you want to have best entrepreneur and best engineers. So as a result of this network effect, Silicon Valley becomes a very special place. Uh, but the question is whether it is too expensive to live in Silicon Valley. So can we do something else as a startup? I'm not talking about the ecosystem. As an individual company, we made a decision to uh, start outside of Silicon Valley. Uh, so I live in Irvine, California, Southern California, and I have a software engineer from uh, UC Irvine uh, working with me in Irvine office. We have a team of software engineers in Japan and Korea. Uh, so this man here, uh, used to be the head of internet division for NEC Corporation, which is a giant, giant Japanese corporation. Uh, we have, let me move this way. Uh, she is a Stanford PhD with robotic and AI, uh, Stanford AI researcher, and the guy who started humanoid software programming at the age of 10, and he won multiple humanoid software competition and became the judge for many competitions. Uh, he was vice president of that robot company. I said, we, we are doing much more exciting. Why don't you work for us? And he decided to move to Japan and work for us. A search engine engineer. We have many other engineers in our team. So, um, and then uh, he is our advisor. He is in Silicon Valley, and he used to be director of Apple for education research. So uh, you know you could build the team outside of Silicon Valley, in my belief. So uh, in terms of investor, where to raise money? This is an important choice. And again, if you have any comments, I'd love to hear. Uh, but if we go with Asian investors, uh, the pros is that investment to startup in Asia is growing in Japan. It grew by 25 times for a corporate VC investment for startups over five years. That's a, that's a huge growth. Uh, and then they understand English 
as a pain. Uh, but the, here's the dilemma that if you raise too much amount of money in Asia, many US VCs are going to see us as a foreign deal. So it's going to get harder and harder to raise money in the United States. Uh, if you go to US investor, these are some of the most sophisticated investor, but they may not understand, for example, Asian uh, English education market. So there is important uh, uh, implication in terms of the company direction. So uh, any comments? Maybe, maybe. Uh, so I, you know, we are doing humanoid-based English education. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think ed tech is a difficult investment segment. Yeah. So uh, beggars can't be choosers. Yeah. Uh, I think you just have to go go to. Yeah. Your, uh, it's like, like building a custom house. You've got to go to. Uh, I think what you haven't got there. Actually, you have. Okay. Is is the strategics who are in the ed tech. Right. Right. Business. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, as I think you can get more resonance there to understand ed tech than the average VC who's looking for right, that, right. That software yeah. kind of thing. And then I'd look at uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jibo's investors and uh, the investors in other robot companies that are not doing the same as you. Yes. That, uh, that, 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 that they, uh, at least the more successful ones might be more, have more appetite. Yeah, that's a great, great advice. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Yes. Uh, well, your, your team seems to be really good, and uh, I, I will do the same. Uh, make it a uh, few people here and a lot of people outside. Talents are everywhere. Uh, but uh, I, I think that you need some focus in, in terms of business. Uh, <coughs> You didn't convince me I'm not an investor, but uh, you, you have to really start talking to some investors just to learn how they think, to get focus and make a very uh, focused business plan so that when it comes to, to the investors you want really to, to get money from, uh, you, you uh, are well-tuned, well-focused, you have an investment thesis appropriately uh, directed to a given market, all the business model and how to get the uh, revenues back and, and reinvest in the company, all, all that. But no, well. Thank you, thank you. That's a great comment. You know, startup is all about focus, 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 right? So, um, yeah, the, the team seems to be really well set. <coughs> But the focus of the company uh, as a business should be uh, fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great comment. Uh, any other comments for this slide? The, uh, the guys who, ra who raised 400 million, I'd call them up and say, yeah. you've got a... VIP got, kids guy. Well, you've got a solution for like uh, older, older kids. It's desktop and right. you don't have these farmers. It's a, it's a more, more educational. You don't have a solution for the really young kids. Why don't you just do a, you know, start with the license discussion and say, here's a solution to <coughs> spread the age mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's so, a great uh, comment. If, if I can make a quick comment, Paolo, and kind of in regard to your comment, I want everybody to realize how unusual it is to have an entrepreneur who's willing to put these questions out in front of everybody because they're the questions every entrepreneur has to go through. And usually you only hear the end result where I believe 100% that we are right, you know, <laughs> and we've made the right decision. So by saying this and saying what the questions are, that's a remarkable kind of opening up to uh, let people see what's involved in this. <laughs> and I, I see the gentleman that's in the way he answers questions, listens, that is very rare for a That's a good idea. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm also very interested in kind of how, uh, in terms of, just got me thinking in terms of customers, potential customers, they're the relationship between the investors and the customers. Uh, so, how, to my perspective, it seems that it's all, almost not the best idea to go for the VIP kit. 
um, but to go for the more price sensitive groups because the VF kids, they have much more resources to leverage to their English, um, especially if they can hire like great human teachers who can teach it now. And even they can go abroad to live for a while. But then for the price sensitive groups, it seems that they're more attuned to this, this, this subscription based um, pay, uh, payment method and also to this um, like state with a uh, mission mm -hmm. and to continue uh, working on this. So it seems that perhaps investor in Asia is more uh, is better in this way since it has a stronger connection with the United States. So I don't know if people could hear. The, the point was that um, instead of VIP kids, because their parents can probably afford human you know, teachers, uh, price sensitive markets may be better. And getting out probably to the Asian investors will get to the investors who understand how those markets behave. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, yeah, price sensitive. Um, I would also check out the governments. So governments like Pakistan, Pakistan, India might be interested um, in robots because of the war. Um, teachers are really afraid to teach there. Mm -hmm. Students don't really have um, a venue's one. So I think if the I think the government has a robot. So you could have you know, basically into that market. Yeah, yeah. In terms of partnerships. Yeah. Well, we are doing part of that by uh, talking with the government in Fukushima. So hopefully we are going to get the grant. So. I have a point to add to this. Uh, well, uh, when you talk about Pakistan, India, or whatever the developing countries, the first thing when the government would uh, concentrate is on the software development side rather than the product side. So it, they, they would think more on the software and what, what exactly is the use of that particular, I mean, is it really worth investing on that? Mm -hmm. And then they'll think about the, the software, uh, 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 you know, uh, affiliated products and the, the market for the same in their country. So the, the best you give it for the uh, mid-level market is what they think about. Right, right, right. May not be the you know highest. Yeah, yeah. not the I'll, I should you know the, the price sensitive. Right? Yeah, not yeah. the VIP. Segments. Right, right. The vast majority of the people, right? Yeah. yeah. Even Understand. the investor side, they would think about two different ways. Uh, one is on the research or uh, R and D, uh, mm -hmm. the startup what you were talking about. We are still working on that, and uh, the real time uh, service uh, or pro uh, software development. Uh, two different uh, yes. uh, sector of VCs. Mm -hmm. Right, no, absolutely. <coughs> I'm curious, uh, what path will take you quickest to getting investment from the people, uh, sort of A people who invest in stock, ma stock markets? Um, so, oh, IPOs. <laughs> uh, yes, and if, um, and in all 200 countries potentially, because um, investors could make your company grow if. You got there, and would it is it the AI path? Is it having the dinner with Professor Dasher around Android software that will um, and natural language processing in more than English? Um, you know, so that your teaching robots could be teaching language in many countries. Mm -hmm. um, and once that software, natural language processing, teaching process is there, then um, the investors will come to your door. But uh, uh, and maybe the wider people will come to your door as well. Uh, it's getting the software down to get to the market, to the IPO. And right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I believe it's the, the uh, education efficacy that we prove with the software. That's the first step to nail down. Uh, we are seeing some hints of that, that people started speaking the words that they didn't speak before. And we want to prove that more and write uh, white paper and so on. And that's probably the first step. Uh, and then expands to other languages, as, as your points, right? So. Did you try corporate licensing partnership? Corporate licensing. Yeah, like you have a corporation who is in the language training business, and they need your technology, 
So therefore, you work with them, they invest in a company, and they have you to open the market at the same time. So they do everything for you. Mm -hmm. And then you have a small portion of investment from there, but big enough for you. And then later on, you have all the corporate partners all over the world, and you go IPO, and you make a lot of money. <laughs> 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 That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they do it in the medical device business. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's a real experience. It's not a pipe dream. Mm. Mm. Maybe I'd love to learn more about that after. after Pay me the consultation fee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, more about the money. Uh, I think we have four more minutes, right? Yeah. So. Um, going back to um, your initial address, that you're targeting to the younger uh, kids, age from two to five, mm -hmm. because it makes sense, you know, their brains are like a sponge. Um, and of course, parents want to spend probably more money with the kids' education. Their institution is high when the kids are younger, <laughs> and their institution wasn't going to be going down a bit. But is Robert, this type of problem can help those who are, you know, the children or maybe adults who are heading for college or maybe in, already in the business field, um, for those who struggle speaking English, can, can, can that help those who want to improve the language? Um, I know that um, you know, Japanese spend six plus years in school learning English, but absolutely no hope to <laughs> carry the conversation when they're entering college or in a company. Um, so what is your goal, like a future goal or vision? Uh, are, are you, do you like to help those who um, struggle English and um, help them to, you know, be able to use for their business so that maybe Japanese or Koreans or Chinese can compete <coughs> in a global business? Or what, what is the vision? I'd like to see the vision. Yeah, so, so as you said, you know, I mean, we are starting with two to five years old, but the goal is to get to uh, older kids. Uh, K-12 is the next goal. I think uh, kids, based on our observation, kids up to the age of 12 years old can be engaged with the robot very much. Uh, but I think we can go uh, higher, older kids, like 18 years old, et cetera. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, I mean, coming from Japan. And when I was young, Japan was very strong. And uh, it's my hope to make my home country to open up uh, its economy to the world more, right? I mean, it's the same for Korea, China, India, and many other countries to become the member of the global community. This is a very important issue, especially for the age of artificial intelligence. I think the world is going to be more and more uncontrollable because we are already seeing AI who only got the direction can beat the human for a chess game. We can do the same thing for many other things. And, and if the future is increasingly uncontrollable, then we want to have the society, society adaptable, adaptable to change. And uh, that's difficult when the economy is closed. And part of my vision is to use the uh, language education as a way to open up uh, the, uh, the market uh, for many countries. So, Actually, that may be a good kind of comment to close on. Did you have closing comments, Yohei, or is uh, that kind okay, of yeah. Because that's a really good comment to sort of end up the session today. We've got some uh, refreshments outside. I'd like to encourage everybody to continue to ask the million dollar questions outside. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how this plays out. Stay tuned. I have a feeling we'll see something. One interesting thing about this is instead of looking at one thing, I, I feel like I'm looking at a pinball machine. You've got this market, which will lead to this market, which will lead to this market, which as long as you find the right path, you right. can really do well <laughs> with this. So thanks very much for coming today. Thank you.